Okay, we will begin this discussion with a word of prayer. Father Yah, we give thanks and praise to your great and mighty name. You are the great I am. You are Elyon. And Father, we just give thanks for our lives and this time to have to come together and discuss your words. Father, may your spirit be with us. May we go through this and may it enlighten and encourage and bring hopefully some more clarity to your words on the kingdom. Father, may you bless this time that we have and may it be helpful for all. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. This is the start of our biblical expeditions and episode one is titled The Mountain of Yah and the Holy City. What and where are they? We're going to go through this presentation and it's going to be covering the different terminologies that are used for the mountain and Zion. We are live streaming and if you join on to the live stream so you can see the presentation as we go through this because it'll only be on the live stream to see and follow along otherwise you can just listen but you may miss out on some some good details we're going to go over the terminologies here of the mountains so you're going to see a mountain of yahweh mountain of elohim mountain of the house of yahweh mountain of the holiness and mountain of zion and then we're also going to talk about zion jerusalem each one of these mountains with the terms we will see that they may be synonymous and they may be talking about the same mountain but different ter different descriptions so that's what we're going to show here and hash through that so it'll be helpful for all to understand better and we're going to be doing this using scriptures from the tanakh the new testament the apocrypha and a few books a few verses from the pseudepigrapha as we listed here and we have a verse here that begins Ronit. at this point a man of god approached and said to the king of israel here is what yahweh says because aram said that yahweh is a god of the mountains but not a god of the valleys i will mm -hmm. hand over to you this entire huge army then you will know that i am yahweh first kings 2028 20, this verse escorted us for a few weeks now as we were preparing this research because indeed God is a mountain or is a God of, indeed Yah is a God of the mountains. As you can see shortly, the scriptures are full of the different mountains and I, we could tell why Aram would start this type of, we'll say this thing about Yah. The mountain of Yahweh and we will either use the term Yahweh or Yahweh and when we're reading these but with the mountain of Yahweh is going to be equal to and we'll do this throughout Mount Sinai Mount Horeb and the mountain of the south so when that term is used these are usually what you will see it being referred to such as in Genesis 22:14. the mountain is in the land of Moriah as you see in the uh, 22 verse 14 when abraham is called to the place of yahweh yaira as it is said to this day on the mountain of yahweh is seen so we know abraham was in the land of moriah when he's talking about this and abraham names the mountain as the mountain of yahweh numbers 10:33, the mountain of elohim is located somewhere between midian and egypt near a place called Rephidim. We see in, in Numbers, it says, they traveled a distance of three days from the mountain of Yahweh, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant traveled three days ahead of them. And then in Jubilees 4, 35, Mount Sinai is the mountain of the south. And he, Enoch, burnt the incense of the sanctuary, even sweet spices, acceptable before the Lord, on mountain of Negev as in the south and this mountain on which you stand on this day which is Mount Sinai 
For additional references for Mount Sinai referred to as Mount Horeb, see Exodus 3.1 and the others that are listed here. We didn't include those references in here as we were just jamming each one of these together. And then secondly, Mount, Mountain of Yahweh is also synonymous with Mount Zion in the biblical city of Jerusalem. We see here mentioned in Jubilees 18, 2 to 15. It also correlates with Genesis 22 above, identifies the mountain of Yahweh as the mountain of Elohim and the mountain of Zion. So we see here in verse 7, he's talking about he drew near a place of the mountain of Elohim. And then in 15, and Abraham called the place the Lord hath seen, so that it is said in the mount of the Lord hath seen, that is Mount Zion. And then we see this referenced in Zechariah 8, 3. Yahweh says, I am returning to Zion, and I will give in Jerusalem. I will, sorry, I will live in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, and the mountain of Yahweh, Tezavot, will be called the mountain of his holiness. And with that, one thing I wanted to point out is that he says, when I am returning to Zion, it will be called the city of truth. And so that may be a future designation of Jerusalem being called City of Truth in the Millennial. So we basically what we are showing in this picture is, and we will talk about it more in the conclusion, that as we were reading the different scripture, what we realized is that the Negev, the biblical Negev, which is the desert in the southern part of the land, is much bigger than the Negev in modern Israel right now. Or most people think that the Negev was just a smaller portion. But really what we saw in the scripture is that the Negev mm -hmm. refers to the entire desert that you see in the south all the way to the Red Sea. And then in addition, we did some research on Mount Sinai and we found uh, incredible research that places Mount Sinai where you see on the picture, we circled it in blue. It's called Jabal el Laws and it really falls in Saudi Arabia, part of the desert. But what we are suggesting based on what we, we research is that the word Negev is a generic term for the entire desert in the south and it spans a much bigger area area that encompasses Mount Sinai. And then what we did is we looked at the route that Abraham took and two people in the Bible took that route. Abraham and Elijah went from Be'er Sheva. They actually walked all the way to Jabal, to Mount Sinai, which we, that is a laws in Saudi Arabia. So we, we couldn't get a walking distance on a, <laughs> online, so we calculated that it would take about 10 days of very brisk walk to, to get there. And then this is the documentary that we highly recommend. If you haven't watched it, we highly recommend for everyone to look into it. It's fascinating, phenomenal documentary that places Mount Sinai in that location. One other thing I want to mention is that you're going to see different colors in some of the slides. The green colors will be designated as the earthly, biblical Jerusalem or Zion when it's referenced. And then the fuchsia pink will be the millennial references of Zion and Jerusalem, Mount Zion. And then purple will be celestial mentions of the heavenlies. So here I'm going to start with the mountain of Yahweh is in the millennial mountain of Zion. And these are mentioned here in Isaiah 2, 3. Many peoples will go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Yaakov. He will teach us about his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion will go forth Torah the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And that's also repeated in Micah 4 too, almost uh, word for word there. And Isaiah 30, 29, your song will be like one that is sung on the night when a holy feast is kept and your hearts will be happy as if walking to the sound of a flute to the mountain of Yahweh, to the rock of Israel. And the mentions where the mountain of Yahweh is the heavenly mountain of Zion is we believe in Psalm 24, one through five. The earth with all its entirety is Yahweh's, the world 
as in the greater realm. We question that with that word because that word world is like universes. It's beyond our earth and those who live in it. For he set his foundations of the seas and established it on the rivers. Who may go up to the mountain of Yahweh? Who can stand in his holy place? Those with clean hands and pure hearts who don't make vanities and purpose of their lives or swear oaths just to deceive, they will receive a blessing from Yahweh and justice of God will save them. So next is the term uh, Har HaElohim, Mountain of the Elohim. So first, when we look at the Torah, in the first five books, Mountain of Elohim is most definitely Mount Sinai, Sinai, okay, or Horeb. That's another name for Mount Sinai. So in Exodus, every mention of Mountain of the Helo Elohim in Exodus refers to Mount Sinai. I'm not going to read all of these verses. Jubilees, I happen to have the Hebrew transcript of jubilee and that's what i used in the research for this presentation so i would be quoting a lot of verses in this presentation from the hebrew transcript of jubilees so here it says and moses went up into the mountain of the elohim and the glory of the lord abode on mount sinai and a cloud overshadowed it six days and he called to moses on the seventh day out of the midst of the cloud. And then in 1 Kings 19.8, Eli mm -hmm. Elijah, as I mentioned before, walks from Beersheba to the mountain of, Elo of the Elohim. I just want to make sure because when it gets translated, many times they would just say mountain of Elohim. But what I found doing research on this term is that usually it will say mountain of the Elohim, except for one case that I found very interesting and I want to share it with you because it blew my mind. So what I found is that in a couple of cases, instead of saying mountain of the Elohim, which is Yah, mountain of Yah, it says mountain of Elohim without the, okay? And I think what we are talking about here is small g gods, okay? Mountain of Elohim as in the small g, little g gods, okay? In that case, it appears to refer to a mountain identified with the fallen angels. And I'm asking, maybe it's Mount Hermon? So then let's look at Psalm 68, 15 through 18. The mountain of Elohim not the Elohim. The mountain of Elohim is the mountain of Bashan. The mountain of peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you fume with envy, you mountains of many peaks? This is the mountain which Elohim, as in God's fallen angels, desire to dwell in, yet Yahweh will dwell in it forever. The chariots of Elohim are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them as in Sinai, in the holy place. You have ascended on high. You took captivity captive. You have received gifts among men, even from the rebellious, that Yah Elohim might dwell there. And then I included a long uh, passage from Deuteronomy that basically talks about Mount Hermon. Sorry. So it's talking about Mount Hermon. So someone needs to mute themselves. Yes, there. Sorry. Okay. In Deuteronomy, basically it's talking about Og, king of Bashan. So Bashan was the area where the giants, the sons of the Nephilim were living in, and Og was the last of them that survived. So in Deuteronomy, they were talking about Mount Hermon being in the Bashan, and uh, I'm thinking that Mount of Elohim without the there is the Mount of the Fallen Angels were actually landed on. Then we have on the next slide, 
We have two Amos passages, one from Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. I strongly believe that both of those passages correlate and they actually refer to Lucifer or who, however you want to call this fallen. So in Ezekiel, again, we see the, the reference to this cherub wanting to he originally he was placed on the mountain of elohim holiness and he walked in the midst of the fiery stone he was perfect so basically yeah he's talking to him you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you by the abundance of your trading you became filled with violence within and you sinned therefore i cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of the Elohim, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the earth, I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. And then in Isaiah, again, there, he's talking about Hillel ben Shachar, which I believe is the same entity that Ezekiel is speaking to. And in verse 13, he said, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the luminaries of El. I will also sit on Mount Moed, or Mount of the Congregation, Mount of Appointed Time, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So that's another reference to this cherub. So I just wanted, I thought it's an interesting find and I wanted to share it that there is mountain of Elohim without saying the Elohim and that's really the mountain of the fallen angels. And I just wanted to add on Ezekiel twenty-eight sixteen. One of the things mentioned about the fallen cherub that we discussed in Revelation is by the abundance of your trading commerce, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. And we talked about that, how the enemy fallen and was deep into commerce and was sinning due to that. It has something to do with that because it's mentioned multiple times. We are going to start with the mountain of the house of Yahweh. So here we have some references to Mount Moriah in the biblical city of Jerusalem. We have 2 Chronicles 3.1, And Solomon commenced to build the house of Yahweh in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where he had appeared to his father David, which he had prepared in David's place in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. 2 Chronicles 33.15, And he removed the foreign gods and idols from the house of Yahweh and all the altars that he had built on the mountain of the house of Yahweh and in Jerusalem, and he cast them outside the city. Yeah, it's pretty sad he was building altars up there on the mountain of the house of Yahweh. Then we see Jer Jeremiah 26, 18, Micah Morshtite was prophesying in the days of Ezekiah, the king of Judah, saying, So said the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed for a field, and Jerusalem shall be heaps and the Temple Mount as the high places of a forest. So we see this prophecy here that it's going to be basically just plowed out, flattened, destroyed, completely wiped out with this prophecy. And we'll touch on that later in the presentation. Also now, the mountain of the house of Yahweh also is referenced as Mount Zion in the biblical city of Jerusalem. We see in 1 Maccabees, it talked about in verse chapter 4, Verse 37, upon this, all the hosts assembled themselves together and went up into Mount Zion. And when they saw the sanctuary desolate and the altar profane and the gates burned up and the shrubs grown and the courts as a forest. That's a description there when they went up to Mount Zion. That's what they saw. And then later in verse 60, at the time also they built up Mount Zion with high walls and a strong tower around about lest the Gentiles should come and tread it down as they had done before. And they set their garrison to keep it and fortified Bershura to preserve it. So we see here them fixing it up, rebuilding it up, the physical city. And then chapter 16, verse 20, it says here, And others he sent to take Jerusalem 
and the mountain of the temple. So it's all correlating here in, in this area as Mount Zion is referenced as the city of Jerusalem. And then also in Judith 9, 13 to 14, and make my speech and deceit to be mm -hmm. their wound and strife, who have purposed cruel things against your covenant and your hallowed house and against the top of Zion and against the house of the possession of your children. So we see all these references to Zion, Mount Zion with the house of Yahweh. Now the mountain of the house of Yahweh is also referenced in the millennial. Isaiah 2, 2, 2, 4. And then Micah 4, 1 through 2 is also a confirmation or a second witness to this Isaiah passages. And I'll read the Isaiah one. Now it shall come to pass in the last days, and the mountain of the house of Yahweh shall be established as head of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many peoples will go and say, Come, let's go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us about his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion will go forth Torah, the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into his plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So we see this happening in the millennial and it's Z Zion is being referenced here as the mountain of the house of Yahweh. Here we have a slide I want to talk about where the mountain of the house of Yahweh. So we're talking about the house of Yahweh. And this is interesting that his feet rests in his house. And in these verses here, it shows it, it proves it. We see that in Acts 7, 49, the heaven is my throne and the earth a footstool to my feet. What house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what place for my rest? And you can also see Isaiah 66, 1 on that. In 1 Chronicles 28, 2, and David the king stood in the midst of the assembly, and he said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. It came to me in heart to build a house for a rest, for the ark of the covenant of Yahweh, and a station to be the footstool of the feet of God. The referencing here, the footstool of the feet of God is going to be in this building that he's built in the evil. See also First Chronicles 28, 6 through 7, further down. And God said to me, Solomon, your son shall build my house and my courtyard. We see here that Solomon's the one that's going to build it, and he's going to set up the kingdom unto the age. And then it gives a disclaimer. If he should be strong to do and to guard my commandments and my judgments as in this day. And we know Solomon does not do that at, in the end there, and that leads to everything else where it goes. Next, the destruction of the temple building, which is the house of his rest. In Lamentations, it's talking about the destruction of Zion and so forth. And once again, here we see it's a place of his rest. O, o Yahweh darkened his anger for the daughter of Zion. He hurled down from out of heaven unto the earth the glory of Israel, and he remembered not the stool of his feet in a day of wrath of his rage. So here it's referencing where his feet were rested and then further down all your enemies opened wide their mouths against you they whistled their and gnashed their teeth they said we swallowed her down besides this is the day which we hope for we found it we saw it yahweh did what he pondered he completed his word which he gave charge from the days of old and he demolished and spared not and he gladdened the enemy over you we see here once again that everything was destroyed temple, Zion, etc. was totally demolished and it was given charge from the days of old. So that's referencing Yah bringing judgment as he warned in the past. And then lastly, Ezekiel's vision. In the vision of God into the land of Israel, he put me on an exceedingly high mountain and upon it was the construction of a city before me. And he brought me there and behold a man and his appearance was like the appearance of a shining brass. So we recognize what that is, and he's there at the, uh, the building of the millennial kingdom. And then Ezekiel 43, 7 is a reference to it. And in the inner court, he said to me, O son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the track of my feet. So once again, he's tying in. His feet rest there in the house of Israel in the temple. So the next title for a mountain is Har Kodesh, which in English was translated into 
holy mountain but actually in hebrew it's it says mountain of the holiness okay so that's what i'm going to be using mountain of the holiness um so first it just refers to a mountain in the land of judah <laughs> okay mm -hmm. not sure what it is other than it's somewhere in the judah land so in Jer jeremiah it says thus says the lord host the god of israel they shall again use this speech in the land of judah and it in its cities when i bring back their captivity the lord bless you O home of justice and mountain of the holiness mm -hmm. And then in the Wisdom of Solomon, uh, chapter 9, 4 through 10, I'm not going to read the whole passage, just a couple of verses. He says, You have chosen me to be a king over your people and a judge for your sons and daughters. That's King Solomon speaking. You said that I should build an inner sanctum on your holy mountains, actually mountain of holiness and a sacrificial altar in the city that is your nest a copy of the holy dwelling place which you established from the beginning so basically king solomon here is saying that the city that is being built on the holy mountain during his time is actually a copy of the holy dwelling place of yah i don't know if you wanted to add anything to it or before i continue Oh, the only thing I want to mention to that is, yeah, that this holy mountain and the sacrificial altar in the city, it's a copy of the heavenly place. We see Moses being able to see, and he builds what he saw in the heavenlies, and he did a copy of it in the desert. And then here we see Solomon building one also being a copy of the holy dwelling place and we know that what solomon built and moses built were not the same thing so the point to what i'm trying to say is that a copy doesn't mean an exact copy but it's in the resemblance of it then mountain of is also a synonym to the millennial mountain of zion so ezekiel a 2040 for on my holy mountain on the mountain height of israel says the lord god there there all the house of israel all of them in the land shall serve me there i will accept them and there i will require your offerings and the first fruits of your sacrifices together with all your holy things and then i have another quote from joel and then from psalms great is the lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our god mountain of his holiness beautiful in elevation the joy of the whole earth is mount zion on the sides of the north the city of the great king god is in her palaces is known as her refuge so here we are talking about a city in the future the millennial city and it's it's huge it has palaces and that's it's the refuge of yeah anything okay nothing more okay yeah. continuing with more references from other books regarding the millennial holy mountain so in Enoch, um, Enoch has several interesting quotes. This one is just blew our mind when we looked at it. So this is Enoch 20, chapter 26 and 27. So he says, And from there I went to the navel of the earth and saw a blessed place that is planted mm -hmm. trees and flowers coming out from a tree that was cut i don't know about you but we immediately thought about all of the humongous giant trees that disappeared and all we have is mountains everywhere on air that look exactly like a fossilized huge tree yeah petrified uh, yeah. petrified tree so that that was interesting to find that verse from Eno. and there i saw a mountain of holiness underneath the mountain in the direction of the east, there was a stream which was flowing in the direction of the north. And I saw in a second direction another mountain which was higher than the former. Between them was a deep and narrow valley. In the direction of the latter mountain ran a stream. And it goes on and on and talks about the different mountains. And then the valley that he sees somewhere in between a couple of the mountains that look like a very 
Ari, then and he asked Angel, uh, Archangel Yoel, what what is this accursed valley? And Yoel tells him this accursed valley is for those accursed forever. Here we'll gather together all those accursed ones, those who speak with their mouth and becoming words against Yahweh and utter hard words concerning his splendor. Here shall they be gathered together and here shall be their judgment in the last days. So anyway, I just added a picture of what came to our mind when we saw that a uh, quote and I wrote a few things underneath. Once we drop the PDF, you can read more about it. Then last, the mountain of the holiness also refers to a celestial or heavenly mountain of Zion. And here we included a few references from Psalms, Ezekiel and Daniel. So I'll just read Psalm 99. So Yahweh reigns, let the people tremble. He sits upon the cherubim, let the earth be shaken. Yahweh is located in Zion and he is high and mighty above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The king's strength also loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt Yahweh our Elohim and worship at his footstool. <laughs> footstool again. He is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests and Samuel was among those who called upon his name. They called upon, the, upon Yahweh and he answered them. He spoke to them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance he gave them. You answered them, O Yahweh, our Elohim. You were a forgiving hell to them, though you took vengeance on their deeds. Exalt Yahweh, our Elohim, and bow down to his mountain of holiness. For Yahweh, our Elohim, is holy. Mount of Zion in the biblical city of Jerusalem. We have here 2 Kings 19.31. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and those who escape from Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And we see this being referenced to the peoples during that time in 2 Kings, not the future. Psalm 74.2. Remember your congregation which you have purchased of old, the tribe of your inheritance which you have redeemed. This Mount Zion, where you once dwelt in. And then in Lamentations 5, 15 through 18, we see here that he's given some woes and in there to those who have sinned. Woes who have sinned because of your heart is faint. Because of these things, your eyes grow dim. Because of Mount Zion, which is desolate with foxes walking about it. Once again, Lamentations is talking about that destruction of Mount Zion. We got the Mount Zion in reference to the millennial here in Joel, Obadiah, Micah, and Isaiah. We have Joel 2, 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in the mountain of my holiness. And then later in verse 30 to 32. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So we see here there shall be a deliverance. This is the beginning of the millennial with Mount Zion and Jerusalem being referenced here. Obadiah 117, but on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance. Talking about the future Zion. And there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Micah 4, 7, I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, even forever. Isaiah 4, 4 to 5. We're talking here about Zion and Mount Zion. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create above every dwelling place of Mount Zion and above her assemblies, a cloud and smoke by day, and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a covering. So once again, we see here in the millennial Mount Zion, 
Once again, the cloud of smoke and fire at night, smoke during the day, is going to be seen and be present there. So that's an interesting tie-in from the pillar of smoke and fire from Moshe to the Millennial Kingdom being present again. Continuing with Mount Mountain of Zion as the Millennial Mountain of Zion in Scripture. So we, we have some amazing quotes from Isaiah here. Some of them were really mind-blowing, so let me read them. So first, Isaiah 18. There are, I would recommend highly recommend to read the entire chapter. It's only seven verses. In verse 4 he says, This is what Yahweh says to me. I will remain quiet and we look on from my dwelling place like shimmering heat in the sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. And on verse 7 he says, At that time, Gifts will be brought to Yahweh Almighty from a people tall and smooth-skinned, from a people feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech, whose land is divided by rivers. The gifts will be brought to the place of the name of Yahweh Almighty. Mount Zion. I thought that was a very interesting verse. I read Isaiah many times, but somehow I never paid attention to this verse, and I just really, I just discovered it. And people that tall and smooth-skinned, that everyone is scared of. I wonder who he's talking about. Yeah, we see here it says the tall and smooth-skinned people from from far and wide yeah and we've seen old portraits pictures and i'm sure others that are listening have seen this in the research that they've done of people walking in a square of a city of a town and they're seeing different sized people there's people twice the size as them walking through the city so this could be a reference to that of picture or image or something that's coming from the millennial reign yeah possible that would be interesting Mm -hmm. yeah it's an interesting thought isaiah 24 21 through 23 in that day yahweh will punish the host as in the powers the host in the heavens probably we're talking about the angels above so in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below they will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon they will be shut up in prison and be punished after many days the moon will be dismayed the sun ashamed for Yahweh Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders with great glory and I'm pretty sure the elders are the saints. Yeah, likely, yeah. yeah. And here's another verse here talking about the moon and the sun being dismayed or ashamed. And then we just read in, what was it, a couple slides back about the similar yeah. thing with the sun and the moon. All referencing to that that revelational period right before Malia Rain. Isaiah 29, 8, as when a hungry person dreams of eating, but awakens hungry still. As when a thirsty person dreams of drinking, but awakens faint and thirsty still, so will it be with the hordes of all the nations that fight against Mount Zion. So here is basically referencing what we saw in Revelation, that there will be a big gathering of many nations that will wage war on the holy city. And in Isaiah 31, 4, 5, this is what Yahweh says to me, as the lion gra- growls or growls, 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 a great lion over its prey, and though a whole band of shepherds is called together against it, it is not frightened by their shouts or disturbed by their clamor. So the Lord Almighty will come down to do battle on Mount Zion and on its heights. Like birds hovering overhead, Yahweh Almighty will shield Jerusalem. He will shield it and deliver it. He will pass over it and will rescue it. We're talking about verses before the start of the millennial and then some point afterwards, which is very interesting outlook 
if that was to be. This verse is in Isaiah reminds me of the verses in Revelation where he says that they will surround the holy mm. city and attack, and it's really yeah. that's the scenario I think that is. Yeah, and it, it's futile. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next, uh, some more verses in Mountain of Zion is the Millennial Mountain of Zion. So from Jubilees, again, I have three three quotes here from the Hebrew transcript. Jubilees one. And the angel of the presence who went before the camp of Israel took the tablets of the divisions of the years, the tablets of the weeks of the Jubilees, according to the Torah and of the testimony, every individual year and the Jubilees from the day of the new creation. And here, when you read it in Hebrew, mm -hmm. it's very clear that he's talking, he's referring to the creation in Genesis 1. And he's calling it new creation. When the heavens and the earth were created and all their words and the power, powers of the heaven and all the creation of the earth. I found it really interesting that he refer to the Genesis 1 creation as new creation. And it brought all kinds of thoughts to both of us when we were looking at it, thinking, what if we had several creations, like we had reset creation, reset creation, and right now we are in a new creation. And maybe this special creation, this creation is special because we have a solution for salvation and redemption as we didn't have in the previous creations. Until the sanctuary of the Lord shall be created in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, and until all the luminaries be renewed for holiness and for peace and for blessing for all the elect chosen of Israel to be that from that day and for eternity. So basically what they are saying in Jubilees is that the angel of the presence that was going, that was walking before the camp of uh, the Israelites as they were mm -hmm. wandering in the desert, he actually had tablets and the tablets had all the information in them starting with the creation until the millennial kingdom. So I, I am assuming that Moses had a glimpse at those tablets and he knew what what's going to happen and also Enoch and it that's why in in my opinion Enoch could write the the 10 week prophecy on the, the new creation piece and it goes back to the many references that the scriptures use to the term each age or eon that the Septuagint uses eon but uh, each age so there is something to that there's a, an age for different time periods and it's just it makes you think that our <laughs> our timeline is just another age, so to speak. But go ahead. Yeah, and then in Jubilees chapter four, he says, "And he Enoch burned the incense of the sanctuary, even sweet spices acceptable before the Lord on mountain of the Negev, which Negev denotes south, mountain of the south, for the Lord chose, and here is." <laughs> Another bump shell. For the Lord chose four places on the earth, the Garden of Eden and the mountain of the Kedem, which is east, and this mountain on which you stand on this day, which is Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, which will be sanctified in the new creation, which is Genesis 1, right? The, the, this creation for the sanctification of the earth. So Mount Sinai is referred to as the mountain of the south or the mountain of the Negev. Remember the picture that we showed you where we are saying that the Negev encompassed much larger area. And then the mountain of the east is a mystery, but we might be solving that mystery later in the conclusion of the presentation. And then we have Mount Zion. Through it, all the earth will be sanctified from all its guilt and its uncleanness forever and ever. That's Mount Zion. Zion, I'm sorry. And then in Jubilees 8, And he knew that the Garden of Eden is the Holy of Holies and the dwelling of the Lord. And Mount Zion, that is inside 
so in Hebrew it says inside, but I'm I'm thinking it means it. Otherwise, it means like inside, like underneath the surface. So he says Mount Zion is at the desert or inside the desert, and Mount Sinai is inside or at the navel of the earth. These three were created as holy places facing each other. So basically, he is placing Garden of Eden facing Mount Zion and Mount Sinai at some point. Then we have Revelation 14. We managed to get a few references from the New Testament, but we didn't really find a lot of references there for Mount Zion. So here he said, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. I'm not going to read all of it, but that's talking about the, Mount Z- the millennial Mount Zion. And then Enoch again talks about mountain of the desert and we are assuming it's Mount Zion because that's what he called it before. And there are some more references that we didn't quote here from Psalms. Here, I just got two verses here to correlate the heavenly Mount Zion in Isaiah 8.18. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion, referencing to where he lives. And then Jubilees 138 in the Hebrew transcript. And the Lord will appear to the eyes of all, and all will know that I am the God of Israel and the father of all the children of Jacob and king on Mount Zion for all eternity, and Zion and Jerusalem will be holy. This ends our part on the mountains, all the different terminology and descriptions of the mountains mentioned that relate to Mount Zion with different names and references for you to review, look at, add it to any of your studies when looking up and pulling scripture references on the mountain of Zion. So we ended up from all of the different terminology, we ended up narrowing it down to three mountains. So we have Mount Zion, we have Mount Zion that existed in biblical time and as part of Jerusalem or as Jerusalem. And then we have the mountain of the east, which is still a mystery until we will solve it later Kadem. but yeah but th- those are the three mountains because most of the names are synonym for mount sinai or mount zion on zion we're going to be talking about zion the city of zion when we looked up the word it appears 152 times in the old testament seven times in the new testament yeah. and is not only used to describe the mountain The Bible describes Zion as the city of David, the biblical city of Jerusalem, the entire Israelite nation, the millennial city of Jerusalem, and the heavenly Jerusalem. And we referenced here the city of David because we're not going to be going deep into that one at all. Just to let you know, Zion was originally the ancient Jebusite fortress in the city of Jerusalem. After David's conquest of the fortress, Jerusalem became a possession of Israel. The royal palace was built there, and Zion slash Jerusalem became the seat of power in Israel's mm-hmm. kingdom. See Second Samuel five seven and First Kings eight one, First Chronicles eleven five, and then regarding the entire Israelite nation, I will bend mm-hmm. Judah as I bend my bow and fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, Zion, against your sons, Greece, and make you like a warrior sword. This in Zechariah 9.13, and in Psalms 126.1-3, through 3, When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues were singing. Then they said, among all the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. And that's the people of the Israeli nation talking about being the captivity of Zion. We're going to touch on the biblical city of Jerusalem and the millennial city, the heavenly Jerusalem, in the next few slides. Zion being the biblical city of Jerusalem, and we'll see multiple references here. I may not go through all of those, but we shall see that we got Isaiah 33, 20. Look on Zion, the city of our festivals. Your eyes will see Jerusalem. Then Isaiah 49, O Zion, who will bring good tidings? Get up. 
Into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. Psalms 51, 18. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. And then Romans 33. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whoever believes in, on him will not be put to shame. I want to touch on 2 Baruch 4, 1 through 3. It has interesting verses here. And the Lord said to me, This city will be delivered up for a time, and the people will be chastened for a time, and the world will not be forgotten. Or do you think that this is the city of which I spoke about when I said, I have engraved you in the palm of my hands? It is not this present building which has been constructed in your midst. It is that which will be revealed with me, and which was already prepared from the moment I decided to create the garden, and I showed it to Adam before he sinned. But when he transgressed the commandment, it was taken away from him as well as the garden. So once again, Baruch is also talking about what Enoch was talking about there. In Tobit 13, 9 through 10, real quickly here, O Jerusalem, the holy city will scourge you for your children's works. And mercy again mm -hmm. on the sons of the righteous. Give praise to the Lord, for he is good. His praise for everlasting king and his tabernacle may be built in you again with joy, referencing to the future Zion. Here is the millennial city of Jerusalem. We already touched on Isaiah 2, 2 through, talking about the mountain of Yahweh. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. We already talked about that one, so here it is again. Zion, for the law will go forth from Zion. So it's talking about that millennial Zion, Jerusalem. And Isaiah 24, 23, When the moon will be abashed and the sun, sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. Once again, tying in that reference, we talked about Isaiah 24 before. Isaiah 66, 7 through 9, Before her travailing to give birth, before the coming of the misery of the pangs, she fled and gave birth to a male. Who heard such? And who has seen thus? Has the earth travailed in one day, or even a nation given birth at once, that Zion traveled and gave birth to her children? We see here, we know that Zion is that place referenced in the future, and it being the people of Jerusalem of Zion. And see also Isaiah 54, 1 and Revelation 12, 5 through 6. Here we also have a few more that gives more detail. Jeremiah 3, 13 through 19 is a good one. Yahweh's talking to the revolting son, says Yahweh, For I shall lord over you, and I shall take you, one from out of a city, and two from out of a family, and I will bring you into Zion. And I will appoint you shepherds according to my heart, and they shall tend you, tending with higher knowledge. And it will be if you should be multiplied, and should grow upon the land, says Yahweh, in those days, they shall not say any more, Ark of the Covenant of Holy Israel. It shall not ascend upon the heart, nor be named, nor shall it be examined. It shall not be done any more. Something I want to point out is that the Ark of the Covenant will not be used or needed in the millennial anymore. And then 17, In those days, in that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of Yahweh. So here, once again, Zion, Jerusalem, is also going to be referenced as the throne of Yahweh. And shall be brought together unto her all the nations, and they shall not go any more after the wicked thoughts of their heart. Romans eleven twenty six, And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And we know what that's referencing to whom. And then in Second Baruch 41, verse 3, I'll cover one here. The last ruler who was left alive at the time will be bound, whereas his entire host will be put to the sword, and they will carry him up to Mount Zion, and my anointed one will convict him of all his wicked deeds, and he will gather together and set before him all the works of the host, and afterwards he will kill him and protect the rest of my people who will be found in my place which I have chosen. So we're talking about the millennial where Yeshua is wiping out all of the enemies there and bringing a rest to the people. And further, 2nd Esdras has some interesting verses here too. Wanted to include them for others to look and research in Esdras 2, 38 through 42. Arise up and stand before the number of those that be sealed in the feast of the Lord, which are departed from the shadow of the world and have received glorious garments of the Lord. 
Take thy number, O Zion, and shut up those of thine that are clothed in white, which have fulfilled the law of the Lord. The number of thy children, whom thou longed for, is fulfilled. Beseech the power of the Lord, that thy people, which have been called from the beginning, may be hallowed. I, Esdras, saw upon Mount Zion a great people, whom I could not number, and they all praised the Lord with song. So here we see this reference to the 144,000, and that scenery is how I'm tying or seeing that one related in this particular passage from Esdras. And then we have 2nd Esdras 13, 29 through 36. Behold, the days come when the Most High will begin to deliver them that are upon the earth, and he shall come to the astonishment of them that dwell on the earth. And one shall undertake to fight against another, one city against another, one place against another, one people against another, one realm against another. That's an interesting one. Very interesting, a realm against mm -hmm. another. What other realms are there? <laughs> and the time shall be when these things shall come to pass, and the sign shall happen, which I showed you before, and then shall my son be declared, whom you saw as a man ascending. And when all the peoples hear his voice, every man shall in their own land leave the battle they have one against another. And an innumerable multitude shall be gathered together as you saw them, willing to come and to overcome him by fighting. But he shall stand upon the top of the Mount Zion, and Zion shall come. That's interesting. Zion shall come and shall be shown to all men, being prepared and built like as thou all the hill graven without hands. Ezra is describing Mount Zion and Zion it, coming. Come. Yeah, whether it's coming or from above, way. coming from the north, coming to rest, and all the peoples coming up at it to fight it, and they will be overtaken as we have yet and read. It, it does remind me of the verses that we just read from Isaiah where he's talking about the multitude that will be coming to fight the city. So continuing with Zion as a synonym for the millennial city of Jerusalem. So in the Testament of Dan, chapter 5, and there shall rise unto you from the tribe of Judah and of Levi, the salvation of the Lord, and he shall make war against Belia and execute an everlasting vengeance on our enemies. And the captivity shall be taken, shall he take from Belia the souls of the saints, and turn disobedient hearts unto the Lord, and give to them that call upon him eternal peace. And the saints shall rest in Eden, and in the new Jerusalem shall the righteous rejoice, and it shall be unto the glory of God forever. And no longer shall Jerusalem endure desolation, nor Israel be led captive, for the Lord shall be in the midst of it, and the Holy One of Israel shall reign over it. Um, in humility and in poverty, and he who believed on him shall reign amongst men in truth. Yeah, I did want to add to this one on the Testament of Dan, on verse 12. It says here, And the saints shall rest in Eden, and then separately, and in New Jerusalem shall the righteous rejoice. So that can be taken to different segments of peoples that rest in Eden and then righteous resting in New Jerusalem. So I just thought that was something interesting to take away from that as perhaps there's, as we know, there's always, there's ranking the mm -hmm. kingdom. And so this may be a different separation of peoples. Just possible. Yeah. Okay. And then in Psalms of Solomon, chapter 11, could either could be either millennial or heavenly. We couldn't make up our mind. So trumpet in Zion with a, si a signal trumpet to summon the holy ones, proclaiming Jerusalem, the voice of one who brings good news for the God of Israel has shown pity in his visitation of them. Stand upon a high place, O Jerusalem, and behold your children from the east and the west gathered once again by the Lord. From the north they come in the joy of their God from the islands far away. God has gathered them. He has leveled high mountains into level ground for them. The hills fled at their approach. 
that kind of reminds us of some other verses from Luke and Isaiah and Job that we mention here. There's also, when you're reading Luke and Isaiah and Job on this, it's also allegorically speaking to the proud being made humbled when he's leveling the mountains. But if you look at this verse, it's saying that God is going to level high mountains into level ground for his people and the hills fled at their approach. So we see this happening, in my opinion, at the millennial, there's a leveling of mountains in whatever area there is, whether it's worldwide or just in certain area. So I'm skipping, I'm going to verse seven. Put on, O Jerusalem, the garments of your glory. Prepare the robe of your sanctity, for God has spoken good concerning Israel forever and ever. May the Lord do what he has spoken concerning Israel and Jerusalem. May the Lord raise up Israel by his glorious name. The pity of the Lord is upon Israel forever and ever. And by the way, this is just a beautiful book, Psalms of Solomon. Yeah, that it's... is a good book to read if you have not read that. Yeah. Good, okay, no. good writings. All right, and wrapping up with the Zion as the heavenly city of Jerusalem. And just three verses we'll cover here before we go into the conclusions. We got Psalms 125, 1 through 2. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. So as he's more or less comparing the Mount Zion and the heavenlies that cannot be moved and abides forever to him surrounding Jerusalem and his people. So it goes back to Yeshua talking about you cannot be taken from the Father's hands. So here, Hebrews 12, 20, 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Yeshua, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And we're talking about that heavenly Zion and the heavens. And then wisdom of Solomon 9, 8. You say that I should build an inner sanctum on your holy mountain and sacrificial altar in the city that is your nest a copy of the holy dwelling place which you established from the beginning here once again referencing this what solomon's building is a copy of the holy dwelling place in the heavenlies just as moses saw and he built his in the desert according to it so once again we see the heavenly zion being copied down here on earth and then as is will the millennial zion be so in resemblance to the heavenly so that concludes with our verses that we pulled together and giving you an understanding of the different terminologies that are being used in scriptures for these places, for the Mount Zion and also for Zion. So with that, with what we've read and what we've looked up, we'll, we will start with a conclusion and a discussion on what we've unearthed and go from there. So before we do, I just, I just saw a funny message from Rebecca. <laughs> So I'm totally with you, Rebecca. I prefer to refer to Yah as Yah. And we try to update most of the quotes, but we it was way too many references that we were using and different translations. So some of them we left with the Lord and the God. So I apologize for it. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't have the bandwidth to go through and scrutinize every sentence. This was yeah. a burden of joy. And so, yeah, we apologize. But we did change some of them. <laughs> we, we did. <laughs> That's why sometimes you will see the Yahweh instead of just Yahweh, because we went and changed the Lord and we forgot the day over there. So it was a lot of work. I apologize. Okay, we have all kinds of thoughts that popped in our heads as we were doing this research and we wanted to share with you some of those thoughts and then open the discussion and we would love to hear your thoughts and about what we are proposing. So let's start. Okay, 
So first of all, let's uh, talk about geography a little bit. The millennial Zion Jerusalem, including Mount Zion, should be located in the geographical location of the land of Judah. This is supported by both the Tanakh, New Testament, Jubilees, and other books quoted in this presentation. As we went through the hundreds and hundreds of references, what we saw is that it even the millennial one is still located in the same geographical location. The desert plays a major role throughout the lives of the patriarchs, the exodus and the conquest of the promised land. A quote from Genesis 20, And Abraham journeyed from there to the Negev, and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and stayed in Gal, that's Genesis 21. Although no specific geographical boundaries define the Negev in the Bible, based on references from the Torah and in the book of Joshua, we believe that the term Negev refers to an extended arid land that spans the entire southern part of the land, all the way to the Red Sea, as well as stretching to the east of the Dead Sea. The land inherited by the tribe of Judah included the Negev. Traditionally, the promised land was considered to be the navel of the earth, Tabur Haaretz in Hebrew. In that case, the biblical Negev was and is still located within the navel of the earth. So, the navel of the earth. Genesis 15 may well be one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. In the same context that Yah promised to be Abraham's shield and great reward, he confirmed his promise of a progeny and a land with a formal covenant. Yah also provided Abraham with important details to alleviate his concerns regarding descendants and their future ownership of the land of Canaan. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt, which is the Nile, to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. That's Genesis 15, 18 through 21. Gesundheit. Yah promised Abraham the land which was then inhabited by ten nations spanning from Euphrates River to the river of Egypt. So if you look to the map on the right, you will see a blue line. That's actually the geographic borders of the promised land from Genesis 15. Yet to the children of Israel, Yah many times mentions the land of the seven nations of Canaan. That's in Deuteronomy 7.1, not 10. That's because the lands of the first three of the original ten nations were given to other members of Abraham's family, specifically the land of the Kenites was given to Esau, Esau's descendants, the nation of Edom, the Kenizzites to Lot's son Moab, and the Kadmonites to his son Ammon. As a result, the land promised to Israel later was smaller, corresponding to the borders described in Numbers 34. In fact, Yah specifically warned the children of Israel not to touch the lands of those nations which were promised to them. That's in Deuteronomy 2, 5, 9, and 19. And the parasha that we just read last Saturday, we saw an example of how Yah made the children of Israel do a huge detour around a dome, but not fight a dome. Yeah, they, yeah. they asked to pass through the land, and no matter how much Edom said no, they were not to attack them, they had to go around. Yeah, this gift to the other nations, however, was temporary. In the Messianic era, Israel will be granted the entire ten lands. 
This is as Isaiah 11.14 states, Edom and Moab will be the reach of their hands, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. See also Deuteronomy 12.20, which refers to a much larger land of Israel in the future. Is the area within the Genesis 15 borders of the Promised Land the geographic center of the earth? Okay, so what we are proposing is that what you are seeing in the map with bordered with the blue line, that's actually the navel of the earth. So according to the Tanakh, yes, this area is the navel of the earth. And we included a few references. We didn't quote them from Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel 5, and Isaiah 19 all of which confirm that all of this area is actually considered in the Bible the navel of the earth. Interestingly, we did some research on what scientists think is the center of the earth, even though, of course, they look at the earth as a globe. Apparently, there is a physicist called Andrew Woods, and he determined, based on a lot of calculation, that the exact center of the earth is somewhere near Ankara, which is the present capital of Turkey, at latitude 39 and longitude 34, and on the same latitude as Mount Ararat, and essentially the same longitude as Jerusalem, which is interestingly within the Genesis 15 borders. So basically, even from mm -hmm. a scientific perspective, the center of the earth is somewhere in this area. Okay, so continuing with the Millennial Kingdom. So, as we demonstrated before, both Zion, Mount Zion, and Mount Sinai are located within the land of Judah. See Jubilees, Enoch, and Exodus, Exodus, Exodus etc. There, here is a quote, a very interesting quote from Jubilees 31, verses 28 through 33. So in this section, Judah and Levi are joining Jacob and are visiting Isaac, okay? And now Isaac is blessing Judah and listen to the blessing that Isaac gives Judah. And to Judah, he, Isaac, said, May God bless you with strength and power so you will tread down all who hate you. Lord or prince, you will be, you and one of your sons, over all the sons of Jacob. Your name and the name of your sons will go forth and traverse every land and every city. Then will the Gentiles fear you, and all the peoples will quake. In you, Jacob, will have salvation, and in you, Israel, will be redeemed. And when you will sit on the throne of honor, your righteousness will grow and peace will abound for all the seed of the sons of the beloved. And whoever blesses you will be blessed. And all who hate you, persecute you and curse you will be rooted out and destroyed from the earth and be accursed. I, I think that he's talking about Yeshua. Yeah, yeah. Issue in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So if the millennial kingdom or the millennial Zion already took place, where was it located and where is it now? Was it located at the same place as the biblical city of Jerusalem, the city that was entirely obliterated and leveled down? Or was it located in the Negev area, a vast land within the land of Judah? Or was it located on the Mount of Olives area? As for where it is now, we are left with four options. Either it was lifted up and relocated, went into hiding subterraneanly, or it is being clocked. We are getting a bit esoteric here. Or is in a parallel dimension. Those are the four options that we could think of. So then we came up with two lo possible locations, one of them for the hiding down under and, and the second option is for being lifted up and relocated. 
Okay. So the first location hiding down under, we picked Mount of Olives for several reasons and I'm going to share them with you and then Rob is going to elaborate on the location that we picked up as the second location of maybe that was the location and then it was lifted up and relocated from there. That's in what is called Ramon Crater in the Negev. Okay. So let me start with Mount, mountain of, Mount of Olives, Mountain of Olives. Mountain of Olives or Har as a team in Hebrew is one of three peaks of a mountain ridge which runs for three and a half kilometers, which is 2.2 miles, just east of the old city across the Kidron Valley in the area called the Valley of Josephat. The ridge runs in general direction north and south, covering the whole eastern side of the city. The peak to its north is Mount Scopus at 2,700 feet, while the peak to its south is the Mount of Corruption at 2,400 feet. The highest point on the Mount of Olives is at 20, almost 2,700 feet. So it's not that tall okay the ridge acts as a watershed and its eastern side is the beginning of the judean desert at its northern end the ridge bends round to the west so as to form an enclosure to the city on that side also on the north a space of nearly a mile of tolerably level surface intervenes between the walls of the city and the rising ground on the east the mount is close to the walls parted only by the narrow vein of the kidron it is this portion which is the real mount of olives of the history its height is not very much above the city it's only 300 feet higher than the Temple Mount, hardly more than 100 feet above the Biblical Zion Jerusalem. Mentioned in many Biblical stories and events, this mountain range is home to rich history, fascinating archaeology, and unending religious fervor. Since the dawn of recorded history, Long before Jerusalem became King David's capital city, the Mount of Olives served as the eastern border of Jerusalem, Salem of ancient times, creating a natural barrier between the city and the Judean desert to the east. This is the reason some scholars interpret the name Zion, often referred to Jerusalem as you saw before, as the city on the edge of the wilderness, since Zion, or in Hebrew, Zion, in the Hebrew language is a derivative of the word Tzia, meaning wilderness. The mount is referred to in scripture as the mountain of olives, the mountain of the Kedem, Kedem is east, Kedem side of the city, ascent of the olives, the mountain that is facing Jerusalem, or simply the mountain. In the New Testament, the usual form, form is the Mount of Olives and also Olivet. In modern times, it's referred to as Mount of Ascension. And here I have a few interesting quotes about referring to Mountain of Olives. The first one from Genesis. And there, Shem's descendants' dwelling place was from Mesha, as you go towards Sephar, the mountain of the Kedem, mountain of the east. From Second Samuel, so David went up by the ascent of the olives and wept as he went up. And he had his head covered and went barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up, weeping as they went up. That's the verse referring to King David finding out that Abs Absalom just declared rebellious against him. Rebellion against him. First king, then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, 
on the mountain that is facing Jerusalem and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. So basically, that's where on one of the peaks of Mountain of Olives, that's where King Solomon built the altars to the idols worshipped by his Gentile wives. From Ezekiel 11, so the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was high above them, and the glory of Yahweh went up from the midst of the city, Jerusalem, and stood on the mountain which is on the Kedem east side of the city. Zechariah 14, and in that day his Yahweh feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the Kedem east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two, from east to west, making very large canyon. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And then from Nehemiah, and that they should announce and proclaim in all their cities in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the mountain and bring olive branches of oil trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of leafy trees to make both as it is written. And from Acts 1, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And last, I'm going back to Jubilees 4, and a quote that I shared before, I just wanted to share it again, and suggesting that the mountain of the Kedem is actually Mount Mountain of Olives. And he, Enoch, burned the incense of the sanctuary, sweet spices, acceptable before the Lord, on the mountain of the Negev, or the mountain of the south, for the Lord chose four places on the earth, the Garden of Eden, and the mountain of the Kedem, the mountain of the east, and this mountain on which you stand on this day, which is Mount Sinai, and Mount Zion, which will be sanctified in the new creation for the sanctification of the earth. Through it will the earth be sanctified from all its guilt and its uncleanness forever and ever. I think Mr. Isolf is what the mountain of the Kedem is. What was the picture of to the right there, just so people know? Uh, okay, so the picture, this is actually a Russian Orthodox church that is built on Mount, Mountain of Olives. It's very gorgeous. And the picture before, <coughs> you can see the mountain. It's actually, I call it actually a mound rather than a mountain at this point. Okay, last a slide I want to share about the Mountain of Olives. Mount of Olives is the only mountain referred to as the mountain by pilgrims arriving at Jerusalem, signifying its significance from ancient time. The largest and the oldest Jewish cemetery in the world is stretching across the western, southern, and eastern slopes of the mountain, totaling more than 150,000 graves. That's amazing. And that's because many people believe that when Messiah will put his feet on Mountain of Olives and it will split, the resurrection will happen. And they wanted to be to have first first straw <laughs> <laughs> when this production is being executed. Yeshua often traversed across the Mount of Olives on his way into and out of the city of Jerusalem. He gave his epic Olivet discourse in Matthew 24 from that mountain top, overlooking the temple courts, and it was from the eastern slopes of the Mount of Olives that Yeshua was recorded to have ascended to heaven. Now he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? That's Matthew 24, 3. Though not large in dimensions compared to other famous mountains in this region and around the world, this mountain offers a breathtaking view of Jerusalem to the west and of the wilderness of Judea and the Dead Sea to the east. It's really a phenomenal vista. Not only does the Mount of Olives appear prominently throughout past and present events, 
but both all the New Testament scriptures position the mountain as a central point for significant future events as well. According to the prophet Zechariah, the Mount of Olives is the very location upon which Yahweh will step down upon as he returns to earth to win the final war against the Gentiles. And New Testament scriptures also make a clear connection to the Mount of Olives, Olives when we referring to the return of Yeshua to earth. And last, immediately following Yeshua's ascension to heaven from the Mount of Olives, the disciples, that's a quote from Acts 1, 10 through 12. While they looked steadfast, steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Yeshua, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day. What we are proposing here is an option for the look the location, the hidden location of uh, the millennial Zion is somewhere underneath the surface here. Number one, this is really a mound if you were to, <laughs> to go to Jerusalem and check it. And number two, so many things are going to happen there based on prophecies. It is going to be split. Things are going to come out of there. So we thought, what if, since this is one of the three holy mountains mentioned in several of the scriptures that we shared, then maybe this is the location of where the city is, is hiding right now. Yeah, if it were subterranean. Yeah, subterranean. if it is subterranean. And then obviously you have the other two being cloaked or interdimensionally, and, and that could be really, whether it's here or anywhere, but those are other considerations. Yeah. Okay. So I, so I think it's a good proposal of this being... A holy mountain, a holy spot, and knowing that it'll be split in two one day when Yah comes, whether it feeds to the thought that it is will rise up out of it or appear from it or whatever, it's one thought of a possibility. Another thought was the Millennial Kingdom during the release of Hasatan for the short season. Perhaps it was lifted up and relocated if it was not cloaked or hidden subterraneanly. So I, I would propose that perhaps it was moved. I want to talk about this location here and then after I talk about this location, I'll go into some scriptures to back up why we think this is possible. So the Maktesh Ramon is a geological feature in Israel's Negev Desert, located some 85 kilometers south of the city of Beersheba. The landform is not an impact crater from a meteor nor a volcanic crater formed by a volcanic eruption, but rather it's the world's largest erosion cirque, steep head valley or box canyon. I guess is the term for that. Yeah. The formation is 40 kilometers long, 2 to 10 kilometers wide, and 500 meters deep, and is shaped like an elongated heart. Today, the area forms Israel's largest national park, the Ramon Nature Reserve. The Maktesh Ramon contains a diversity of rocks, including clay hills known for their fantastic red and yellow colors and forms. Impressive mountains rise at the borders of the crater. Har Ramon, Mount Ramon, at the southern end, Mount Arden at the northeastern end, and two table mountains, Mount Marpek, which means elbow, and Mount Katum, means cropped, along the southern wall. The hills to the northeast edge of the Maktesh were once entirely covered by spiral ammonite fossils ranging from the size of snails to uh, to that of tractor wheels <laughs> to, wow to the size of tractor wheels although these have mainly been extracted so only smaller fossils can be found here today Givat Gaash a black hill in the north of the Mak Maktash, so you can say crater. <laughs> was <laughs> once an active volcano which erupted thousands of years ago and caused it to be covered in lava which quickly cooled 
in the open air, converting it to basalt. Limestone covered by basalt can also be found in smaller black hills in the southern part of Mactush, including Carney Ramon. And this is obviously what the scientists are saying here. Shen Ramon is a rock made of magma, which hardened whilst underground. It later rose up through cracks in the Earth's surface and today stands in striking contrast with the nearby creamy color southern wall of the crater as a black sharp edged rock. Interesting how it was somewhat magma hardened and then rose up out of the ground somehow. In the center of the Mektush is Ha Minshara, the saw mill, a low hill made up of columnar jointed sandstone polygonal prismatic columns of quartzite. And we're going to show some pictures of this. The crater is named Ramon after the abundance of mollusks, an extinct mollusk, so it's named after, that is found in its rocks. And we have a link there to check out some more information on that. Link history. is to check uh, the geology of Israel within a biblical context. So it's really yeah. interesting article. Here we're going to go through some pictures of this uh, Ramon area, this crater. And as you see on, this, on just the side of the crater, how deep it is in, in some areas. And as we said before, it was, what, 500 meters in, in average around it. And you could see the people, how small they look compared to this uh, ridge. Here's a view of a, another heart-shaped crater within this crater that can be seen. So I thought that was very interesting. That is in this even larger crater. And then here's the picture of the elongated heart crater. It is, like we said, about Oof. 20 miles long. And as you can see here, the different colors in this particular crater and perhaps if the theory mm -hmm. is what we propose it being lifted out at the ground from b below being exposed and perhaps different colors from whatever was connected into the ground from what was above so if we picture a city being above it i'm sure they have things flowing out from the city that were connected or gone through or into the ground and so forth so just some thoughts and then here is those prismatic hexagonal rocks which is very interesting to see this in and around this crater we see this in petrified mountains and or trees so that's another interesting thing that's caused by lack of oxygen and high heat so whether this was the kingdom being risen up from thermal activity or anything to that effect, who knows? But this is some foods for thought. Some more pictures of the area. As you can see, the ridges and the colors, the many different colors, and even in the ground, the rocks, and in embedded in the rocks. So something very interesting about this crater and the rocks of this. So we propose this possibility the kingdom and city and the mountain was here and then lifted up and moved to another location. So lifted up and relocated. Why would I think that? Let's look at Ezekiel 40 verse 2. And it led me to a vision of God in the land of Israel and put me upon an exceedingly high mountain. And upon it was the construction of a city before me. So we see a reference to the millennial Zion being a very high mountain. And then we read in Micah 4, 1 and Isaiah 2, 2, and it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and the peoples will stream to it. Once again, another reference to how high and how tall this mountain is going to be to others, it being the chief of mountains. Psalm 99, Yahweh is great in Zion and is high above all the peoples, raise up high Yahweh our Elohim and do obeisance at the footstool of his feet for he is holy. So once again, high above all the peoples, these references of how high Mount Zion is, the chief of mountains. And then here we want to also look at mountains being leveled by Yahweh. So we know that Yahweh can do this. Uh, Zechariah 4, 6 through 7, we see that uh, in verse 7, who are you great mountain before Zerubbabel, you leveled it and he will bring out the capstone and shouts of grace to it. So we know that Yahweh can level it, he can flatten mountains, he can destroy them, etc. And we see in Psalms of Solomon 11:4, he has leveled high mountains into level ground 
for them, his people. The hills fled at their approach. So we can see that this can very easily happen by Yah. Earth being shaken by Yahweh. We see verses that talk about this. And one, one verse I wanted to bring up was Haggai 2.6. Yahweh's telling Zerubbabel after the rebuilding of the second temple, for this is what Yahweh of armies says, in just a little while, I will shake the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the dry land. So now that we see that what can be done, let's talk about what Yeshua did and what Yeshua can do. So we see here, well, let's talk about mountains being moved by Yahweh. So Matthew 17, 20, and Yeshua said to them, because of your unbelief, for truly I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will be moved and not a thing shall prevail over you. So we see it is possible. And how do we know it's possible? Matthew 21, 18 to 22, and returning early to the city, he hungered and seeing one fig tree by the road, he went up to it, and this is Yeshua, and found nothing on it except leaves only. And Yeshua said to it, let there be no more fruit from you forever. And the fig tree immediately dried up just by his words, okay? And seeing this, the disciples marveled, saying how quickly the fig tree dried up. And answering Yeshua, they said to him, Truly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only will you do the miracle of the fig tree, but even if you should say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will be so. And all things, whatever you may ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. So here he's even telling the disciples, if you have this kind of faith, you can move mountains. In Mark 11, 22 through 23, we see here also another confirmation. In responding, Yeshua says to them, have belief in Yah. For amen, I say to you, that whoever should say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. We see here Yeshua proved it by his words with the fig tree, immediately they dried up and that tree was cursed. And so we know Yeshua said, you can even move mountains. We know if Yeshua can do that, he can move mountains too. So after the destruction from Armageddon, what if the mountain was erected in the land of Israel and the new city temple was built there, or it was just placed there? Whether you want to say it was erected, came out of the ground or came forth from another place where it was residing and then placed there however you want to view it or see it. By the words of Yeshua, he could have done so. He proved it so. He could move mountains. He could have brought a mountain to where he wanted it, and he could move a mountain where he wanted it. Then we see later another world event happening when Hasatan was released for a short time in Revelation 20, verses 7 and 8, at the, the ending or the coming to the end of the millennial reign. We see that happening. It may be that Mount Zion moved from here to there, meaning where it was, it, it was lifted up and moved. Just like Yeshua said, if you have faith, you can move it and move it into the sea. Maybe he moved it into another place and we'll talk about that. We know the geography has changed because we've seen old maps. Older maps from the 14, 1500s do not even look like the same ones that we have today. So there could have been some changes in the geography from then until now, whether it was the Millennial Kingdom during this period and with some changes happening upon Hasatan's release, etc., with any type of terrestrial changes. And we know that from him being released from the pit, that this very well may have happened. All right, so we are going to talk about the conclusions here, and Ronit and I will go through this and speaking about the thought of it being lifted up and moved, we're going to speculate what some of those options could be. And remember, this is just speculation and you can do whatever you want with this, but uh, we wanted to at least present some views for people to research themselves and to think about. So we're gonna first start with the moon map. And there's people in here that subscribe to the moon map or have interest in the moon map. And if you're not familiar with this, it's more or less taking the moon and doing a negative of it, of the colorizations, and then trying to look at it and see if there is, if the moon is a reflection of our realm at some point in time. Not to say it's an accurate reflection of it currently, because it obviously doesn't change. So maybe it was a snapshot picture in the past. Just possibilities. And if that is so, there is some similarities on this that do represent our realm today. 
And in this picture here, in the concentric circles of red, would be considered our realm or our earth. And you will see other continents on there or islands that no longer exist. And perhaps those sank or the, the land masses have changed in some points in time over the periods. So these are just possibilities to consider if, th if this reflection of this map is true. The light blue circle on this is more or less just a depiction of the center of the whole entire greater realm. And then the little pink dot here is Israel and the Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is the aquamarine, I guess is that color <laughs> there. So you can see where that's located. So that gives you an idea that those two dots are in that Israel, Saudi Arabia area and to its left would be Africa and going all the way over and just below it would be Saudi Arabia north of it would be Europe and then of it would be Russia etc and then the circle that is in a lighter color I think it's a like light pink or peach would be hyper uh, Borea in the North Pole and then this pink circle would be the United States and then below that is South America so that gives you a view of what this moon map could be showing if it was a reflection of the realm at some point in the past when the moon was mm -hmm. set, so to speak, in its judgment, as we have read in other books. So with this quote, we already shared before that it was a good point in time to bring them back because yeah. they refer to the level of the earth. And so when we started this journey, we were wondering what is the navel of the earth is are we talking about the circle in the blue circle in the middle mm -hmm. that is the navel the center of the extended trial or is it what we shared before the navel of the earth of our area we just brought it back and yeah we just wanted mm -hmm. to bring these together so that they're all together mm -hmm. on one slide and you can look at the holy places that are mentioned the garden of eden mount zion Mount Sinai, and as you said, the Mount of Olives. All right. We wanted to end with the the map of a, something deeper to think about with the moon map. And you don't have to subscribe to that at all. You can just look at the flat earth and look at the navel of the earth is what we talked about. And that the things we proposed of where Mount Zion and Zion could have been located and in the millennial kingdom. And then perhaps it was lifted up and moved, whether it's in the sea, whether it's in the North Pole, whether it's outside the realm beyond Antarctica. We don't know, but I think there is definitely a good possibility and evidence through Scripture that it could very well and easily have been picked up and moved, as we have shown. So with that, I'll end in a quick prayer, and then we'll close this and open it up for discussion. Father, we thank you for this time of digging into your words and pulling out these references to your kingdom, to Zion, and your holy places. Father, we are just trying to figure out and understand more about you and our future home. And we now are living as if we are living in the kingdom in righteousness and in holiness and in faith and trust in Yeshua. And Father, we thank you for opening our eyes, giving us shalom. May we continue to walk humbly in the fruits of the Spirit with love, joy, kindness, meekness, and especially love. And may we love one another and may we treat others as we treat ourselves, Father. I pray for all those listening. May it be a blessing and may you enjoy digging deeper into this. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.